In today's show, we're looking at more NBA draft prospects for the 2021 NBA draft with Richard from the Locked On NBA Draft Podcast. Michael Bolton. Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it, indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at basketballmonster.com and at Yahoo Sports Australia. And you can find me on Twitter as always at redrock underscore b-ball and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. We are here for our eighth NBA draft prospect show. So we're going to be covering all the guys that you think we've missed out on. But here we are to talk about those once again with one of the hosts of the Locked On NBA Draft podcast, and that is Richard Stayman, also known as Mavs Draft on Twitter. Richard, welcome back. Thanks for having me. It's good to be back. So let's go through some of these prospects, a couple of other you know, top 10 guys we're going to touch on here, the guys we haven't talked about. And let's, let's just start straight off. Let's get stuck into it right away. Because we've got Keon Johnson, the wing from Tennessee, uh, six foot four guard slash small forward sort of a player. He's 19. He averaged just 11 points per game. Um, not particularly great numbers. A steal, half a three, three and a half rebounds, 21 usage. So those numbers you look at and go, oh, that's pretty rough. Like, so why is why is he being talked about as like a, a guaranteed lottery player? Yeah, so there's a few things. One, he's probably one of the highest swings for the fences in the class. If his jump shot does turn around, you know, you see that 70% from the line. I think the shooting form isn't broken, which is positive. Um, There is some concerns with him being, you know, not quite a combo guard, but also not quite a wing. So he's an odd tweener. You don't really hear that phrase thrown around in 2021. But he's got a crazy motor and probably has one of the highest defensive upsides in the class. And if you can guard wings at 6'4 at a high level, you're going to be able to, you're going to be highly coveted. Yeah, and also he is insanely athletic. Um, I believe he had a 48-inch vertical at the combine, which is crazy. We Now we know sometimes the combine measurements are a little off, but that I guess that sort of tracks with what we saw from him in-game as well. Yeah. So, I mean, he's crazy athletic, like I said, and I think that plays into his defense, right? Like that's, that's a big part of why he can be a stopper. He can beat you to your spot so quick. His lateral quickness is incredible. His recovery ability, and he can even block shots well for a guard. Yeah. And yeah, a six, seven wingspan, yeah, decent enough wingspan there. And that ability to, to play that defensive level on the wing, which is a highly coveted thing. Now we touched on it already, but I better give the numbers because he hit 27% of his threes and he only took yeah, one point eight per game. So he's not really any sort of a spacing threat at all. Is he? Maybe that happens. Maybe it doesn't. But is there any hope for him to be something more than just a defender? Can he be a an initiator? Can he pass at all? Is there any hope for that? Another thing you always see with Keon also is that he he started basketball pretty late. So are we? You know, a lot of the time, that's a bullshit narrative as well. That the, just because they started late doesn't mean they're going to all of a sudden yeah, hit their peak at age 30 and they're just behind the curve in development. That's not necessarily how it works. But is there any hope for him to bring something else offensively if it's not shooting? Yeah, the passing is a big one, and that's a big part of why he is that tweener. I really think that he could be a slasher, uh, someone that can put pressure on the rim just because of that athleticism and potential to be a ball handler just because of his size that has to come with the territory. Um, I think his calling card, though, is going to be through defense, whether it's off-ball defense, on-ball defense, or whatever it is. One way or another, I think his first two years, you're going to know him as a defender first. So what sort of player are we looking at, yeah, his similarity in the NBA? Um, yeah, I look at the Atlanta wings, like DeAndre Hunter, Cam Reddish, who came in really with a focus on, well, Reddish sort of more developed into that defensive player in the NBA, but Hunter with that real focus on being a defensive guy. Is he, yeah, the athleticism aside, is he similar to those sort of players? I think you kind of look at Marcus Smart as okay. a guy who's, he's not quite a point guard. He's not quite a small forward, but he can do everything in between of those two. 
All right, so that, that's obviously, if you can get someone of the Marcus Smart level defensively, then that, that's great. And then, you know, Smart has worked on his passing a lot and, and his shooting has improved. Um, and we hope that Keon can get to that level. But I think Keon's starting from a fair distance behind where Smart was in college in terms of in terms of shooting ability. We just hope that it can come along. But having that size and athleticism and defensive ability and some passing vision at this point in his career is, is obviously a, a really, really strong start. And do you have him as a, a top 10 player? I have him in my top 15 at the very end. Okay. Just because that floor is pretty low, but the upside is really high. It's probably one of the best rotation players. Interesting. So, yeah, you know, long term, your best case scenario is it all star or is it just long term starter? It's somewhere in between where you might make an all star or two, but he's not going to be a guy who's racking up. You know, he's not a lock to be in that all star range. Oh, he, he's, he's another idea of a player comp, probably more mid career Andre Iguodala. Where you know in Philadelphia he was getting a lot of usage, but then he turned into more of a like a passing, facilitating, defensive specialist. You know, I don't think Keon can ever do that high level usage stuff that uh, Andre did in Philadelphia, but maybe Denver and Golden State, Igadala. Yeah, I could see that a little bit with the lack of a jump shot. It's obviously hard because you can't play uh, Keon at the five quite like you could Igadala, but that mm. same mold and the general idea is definitely similar. And Iguodala obviously was uh, an insane athlete back in uh, back in his early years as well. Huge, uh, yeah, detonating type uh, dunker back in those early days. Let's move on to the next player, and that is a guy that gets he's getting a lot of hype at the moment, and that is Scotty Barnes, six nine forward, nineteen years of age from Florida State. And we talk if Keon's numbers look bad, then averaging ten points per game is pretty rough for Barnes. But four rebounds, four assists, half a three. 50 from the field is good, but you know, 62 from the line. And all right, so people are suggesting, yeah, Barnes, he, he might be able to push in B. Yeah, maybe he can be the fifth pick in this draft. Maybe he can push in. He's a definite top 10 guy. What if he What if he develops a jump shot? I mean, Kawhi wasn't a shooter coming out of college, so maybe Barnes can do that. But let's just get this out of the way now. He's a terrible shooter. Like, he's a terrible shooter, and the vast, vast majority of players who are terrible shooters don't turn in to Kawhi Leonard. Now, Barnes has... Really good vision. He played point guard. He can probably play small ball center at times. And the defensive stuff is there. But I think if we're viewing him as like, well, if the jump shot comes, he's going to be Kawhi. When we should be looking at guy. If he can actually become this elite switching defender, then maybe Draymond Green is more of a, of a comparison type player. I just think banking on him to be even a good shooter at this point is probably fooling yourself. Yeah, it's what I've said for him is that his shooting is a bonus, not a not a red flag or a flaw. Like he will be just fine without that jump shot. But also banking on him developing that is honestly in a reach, I would say. Um, I think, you know, Ben Simmons is a comparison. Obviously, right now is probably the absolute worst time to be saying that, uh, given what just happened in the Eastern Conference semifinals. But you know, he needs to speed up his jump shot. Like, that's no secret. The touch is, like, okay at best, hence the 62%. But if there was someone who could work to get it fixed to an extent, at least serviceable, Scotty Barnes is a good candidate. I've heard good things about his work ethic. So he's a candidate to improve the jump shot and defy the odds. So how good is his defense? Like, in terms of perimeter defenders, where does he rank in this class? He's probably top five. He can guard just about every single position. Like you said, he could play some small ball center. Um, and actually, you know, you said Iguodala for Keon. You could argue yeah. that you could use him in the same death lineup way that Iguodala was used as a non-shooter. Just let him shoot and maybe he shoots 33% at some point. Like that's a that's an optimistic outcome, of course, but something like that is feasible. Now, we talked about that he ran as a point guard for Florida State. In, and that's, you know, at times Draymond Green will play center defensively and then run as a point guard offensively. Is there any hope for him to be an NBA caliber play initiator, play creator like that? Absolutely. So he has crazy good vision thanks to his height. And he can also just see over defenses naturally because of that. But he's also a really good live ball passer with both hands can use his left hand almost as good as his right hand, which is pretty impressive for a freshman. Has a crazy good basketball IQ, makes advanced reads, is pretty smart about turnovers he does need to improve that but i think that's more of a youth thing and not a you know lack of understanding out of all the prospects i've covered so far like we've done i'm trying to count how many like 42 prospects so far on this show the consensus well not not even consensus the idea seems to be the best passes in this class are cunningham giddy and sharif cooper 
um, where would you have Barnes in that group? Would you agree that they're probably the best passers and where would Barnes sort of fit in there? Barnes is close. Cooper's definitely not a bad option. I would say, honestly, Jared Butler could get some consideration before Sharif Cooper, but that's probably nitpicking. And then I would say number five, I really like Scotty Barnes. You can't dismiss how the versatility helps his passing ability and makes, even if he's not doing it at the volume, doing it once or twice does is more than a guard doing it four times, you know? So you, you, we talk about the bad shooting and you know, I, I get gather that you're under the impression that it doesn't hold him back. Like it's not going to turn into a Michael Carter Williams situation where you, you just can't play this guy because everything else he does is at that high level. Can you ever see a situation where it's just, he's just so bad and so unplayable also, you know, the offense is so bad and the sh- sorry, the shooting is so bad that he just can't be on, on the floor and teams that is going to leave him too, too far alone. Or is that passing really making up for that? So I think in the playoffs, you'll see that could be an issue just because like he's a great slasher, gets to the line and gets to the rim as he wants because his strides are just so long. But in the playoffs, the court shrinks and that kind of hurts him. But as a passer, it would reduce his effectiveness just because teams can sag off and then play off ball, play the passing lanes a little bit more. But I still think he's going to be positive as a playmaker for others, even without a jump shot. So let's say we're, we're living in a scenario where you know, I am a time traveler, right? And let's let's just ignore that, that part that that's not real. But I'm a time traveler. I've come back and I've told you it's the you know, year 2026. And Scotty Barnes shot 37% from three on four attempts per game. Would you say, all right, clearly time to travel is not real? Or would you say, oh, I, I can buy that? No, I, I would say time travel is not real. <laughs> there you go. So that's the uh, that's the upside on Scotty Barnes. Even though he, he might become average. And uh, Rich is saying, absolutely no chance, you lying prick. All right, let's move on to the next uh, to the next player we're going to look at. And that is the aforementioned Jared Butler. 20 years of age, 6'3 guard from Baylor. Let's bring up his numbers there. 16 or 17 points per game, two and a half threes. Pretty decent usage and true shooting, 60% there. Average five assists per game. You've already referenced him as a, as a good level passer, a high level passer. But let's get the big thing out of the way here. There was some medical concerns with Jared Butler, Richard. Yeah, so he had he had a heart issue that had plagued him a little bit before committing to Alabama and forced him to re uh, recommit over to Baylor and it came back up at the NBA draft combine that's up to the teams to determine the severity but it is something that was lingering before and that some people had known about already so he wasn't able to participate in I think most of the combine due to that that heart issue there's no word that it's you know going to stop him from being drafted or, or anything along those lines but it is something to pay attention to now he is a third year junior he played unbelievably exactly the same amount of minutes this season and last season, 30.4 in 30 games across both years. He averaged 16 and 16.7 points. Why didn't he come out after his sophomore year? That's a good question. I was actually asking myself that last year because I had him top 30 in a weaker class, but it obviously worked. I think he wanted to get that national championship that, you know, they got robbed of a chance to even attempt last year because of the, the shutdown. So I think, for him, that, that had to be the biggest motivation, um, and he proved himself worth it. I think he honestly improved his stock somehow. Yeah, well, he was able to increase his assist numbers up from three to almost five per game. He almost averaged two steals per game as well, which is obviously uh, really impressive. So is he strictly a point guard? I think so. I think he's probably limited to guarding ones and twos and then playing point guard. Uh, on the offensive end. And like you said, the the assists went up. And I think that was a testament to what him playing next to NBA talent and NBA shooting will look like at the next level. We saw his assists, that's almost doubling. And, you know, he had a lot of NBA talent next to him. And I think with more shooters and more spacing, you're going to see more of the same in the NBA from him. So... Yeah, he's six foot three, so he's not small, but he's not huge. Um, yeah, some shooting ability, 42% this year, 38%. Um, in the previous year on really good volume, solid free throws, good assist numbers. Is he is he a first-round player? I think so. I actually don't know if he gets first-round pick now, though, with the heart condition. Again, that's up to NBA teams. That's just pure speculation. But I can now understand why they may take him in the second round just because of the medical risk and you know the guaranteed contracts and everything like that. 
another guy who was like a, an older college player who came in and was a second round pick and now has developed into an almost all star level point guard is Malcolm Brogdon. Not saying that they're necessarily the, the same player, but you could, could you see Butler having that sort of career trajectory where he does go later in that second round or you know early second round, but late, later in the draft and then just works as a really solid shooter, really good defender who can distribute and, and works on his skills. Is that a, a fair, your know, best case trajectory? I think it's a fair comparison. I mean, they have a lot of similar skills as good defensive minded players, really able to run the point and can also shoot and are just that jack of all trades point guard. So I actually like that comparison, especially given the fact that I was very low on Malcolm Brogdon's shooting coming out and he improved it a lot. Jared Butler doesn't have to do that. Before we get on to the next player, I'm going to tell you about Built Bar. It is the best tasting protein bar ever. Richard, Built Bar, what's your favorite flavor? Cookies and cream. You can't go wrong. Yes, cookies and cream is excellent, and they don't have it anymore, and it's so annoying. So I'm sorry to make this ad for Built Bars telling you about how good a flavor one that doesn't exist at the moment is, but cookies and cream was absolutely excellent, and I, I want them to bring it back. But they do have currently nine delicious flavors, including coconut, raspberry, double chocolate, salted caramel, and they bring those limited time ones in. And if you see cookies and cream back, go and buy yourself a box. But if you don't know what your favorite flavor is, get a mixed box. There's 18 bars in there. You get nine flavors, so two of each flavor, and you get to try to find out which one is your favorite. Most of these flavors, though, they're also healthy for you. All of them are healthy for you, but most of the flavors have 17 grams of protein, 130 calories, just four grams of sugar, and four grams of net carbs. Richard, maybe you can answer me this question. How come when I'm reading these Built Bar ads, that I've got, I talk about 17 grams of protein, but Americans don't use grams. What, why are we using grams in these ads? Is that, you know, it could be because we're talking about health and science, we have to use proper measurements instead of you know, made up things like ounces and pounds. <laughs> I think it's the latter. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so guys, enough of me shading American uh, imperial measurement system. Go to builtbar.com and use the promo code LOCKED15. That's L-O-C-K-E-D-1-5. And you'll get 15% off your first order. The promo code is LOCKED15 for 15% off at builtbar.com. All right, next player. After Jared Butler, uh, if I bring my list up, we're looking at Kessler Edwards, another three-year guy from is it Pepperdine or Pepperdine? I never know how to say that one. Pepperdine. Pepperdine. Doesn't look like it should be, but there it is. 17 points. He hit two threes per game, seven rebounds. Excellent free throw numbers, 88%, 61% true shooting for Edwards. He hit 38% of his threes. In fact, 39% right across his three-year college career. So I think it's safe to say we can say that Edwards' skill is as a, as a, as a really strong wing shooter. Is What else does he bring? Is there anything else that tops that skill that Edwards has? Yeah, so I think he actually, his best skill is probably his off-ball defense. He's a good on-ball defender, but he's borderline elite at off-ball defense, just rejects everything, really hard to get past him. You can't cut past him or anything like that. And he's just a really high IQ basketball player. His defensive stats are excellent as well. One steal and 1.2 blocks. Last year, it was one steal and 1.9 block, which as a 6'8 guard wing, like getting a steal and a block per game while hitting close to 40% of your threes. Like that is the definition of, of a three and D wing. And plus the, the off ball wing defense that you mentioned as well, which doesn't always show up in the stat sheet. So that's to me, a really valuable player. So why aren't we hearing Edwards as being discussed as a you know, top 20 pick? So I think it's a few things. One, his pull up jump shooting is kind of uh, to put it bluntly. It's rough. He puts the ball really out in front of his face, uh, makes it a very blockable. That's a little bit of an issue. He also doesn't have much of a first step or a, drip, uh, a burst, excuse me, and struggle, struggles dribbling past defenses. Um, and then also, you know, I, I think that it's just his decision making can come and go. And then also he played at Pepperdine. So it's not exactly the sexiest place to play. So you know, what you're describing there sounds like Tony Snell, a guy that can be a really good spot up shooter who can be a really good defender. But what the hell else is he doing? Is that fair? <laughs> I think so. Cause uh, you know, a lot of his strengths, like he was a very good finisher at the rim. He shot 69% at the rim. Um, you know, I don't know if Tony Snell can ever do that, but how much of that is because he played at Pepperdine and how much is that the skill that'll translate, you know, he, is he a draftable player? I think so. I would take him mid second. Yeah, There's I a lot of people that would put him first. So Okay. Whatever that means. Yeah, look, I, I think he probably has to go in that second round. Again, finding a guy with that level of defense and that level of shooting, there's always a role in the NBA, whether that's a high-level role, whether it's an eighth man playing 20 minutes a night, whether it's as a low-usage, low-minute starter around a whole bunch of other um, you know, high-usage players. Like, for example, 
You put him in Brooklyn with Harden, KD, Kyrie around him. He just sits out there, hits threes, and plays defense. Like, yeah, that's that's the role that Bruce Brown sort of plays. But Edwards perhaps uh, does that at a higher shooting level. Like, that's could he be that sort of player? Yeah, that's the kind of role you want. Is off the bench, fits into any lineup, and it's just low usage, but does all the dirty work. All right, let's move on to the next guy on our list now. A uh, an interesting player, another one of these G League Ignite guys, and that is Isaiah Todd, six ten forward slash center. He's nineteen years of age. He averaged twelve and five, and I look at him as a six ten guy who's, who's you're probably really a center. And the fact that he had forty four percent field goals makes me go, oh, okay, what is uh, what's the problem there? So what is the problem there? Why is that efficiency so low? Yeah, so I think it's. I think it's just the lack of explosiveness. He kind of tried to do too much out of the post. He wasn't a great finisher. Despite being a good athlete, he wasn't explosive getting to the rim, didn't really dunk over guys like he should have. For a guy with his uh, size, athleticism, and slashing ability, ability to put the ball on the floor. So that's, I think, a big thing for him as he continues to add weight, see if that comes along. So looking at those numbers, again, 0.7 blocks, pretty low for a, a center. He's in 24 minutes a game, low rebounding. So to me, he looks like, well, he, he's a center who doesn't finish well, doesn't block shots, doesn't defend, doesn't rebound. What, what's he doing? Like he's hitting a three a game at 36%. That's encouraging. But is that a fair judgment of his game of a, a poor rebounding, poor rim protecting, poor defending, poor finishing big man? Yeah, so I think he's kind of that modern four who is just offensive-minded more than anything. Uh, You know, he might leave a lot to desire on defense. I think that's far and away his biggest swing skill because in the G League, you can't tell about team defense. So I think that's something that it's hit or miss. And if he misses, it's really going to negate a lot of his offensive skill. He's unique. 6'10", can put the ball on the floor, hit step backs, turn around fadeaways really highly. I think you're looking at a shot-creating four when you look at Isaiah Todd. So can he play next to other big men? Yeah, easily. Especially if you put him, let's keep going with Atlanta. Uh, you put him in Atlanta, say John Collins walks, right? You, as long, you know, that's not a good replacement right away, a raw power forward. But say down the road, you put him next to Clint Capella, they really complement each other, almost in the same way Collins complements uh, Capella. So is he the same level of like explosive vertical athlete as Collins? I think so in an open floor. The issue for me is he's not quite that in a tight contested area around the rim. Um, but his if he can get more comfortable, I think it's more of a want thing than an actually athleticism limitations thing. Okay. So interesting player there who, again, it is hard to fully grasp the G League guys because we've never seen this before. And they're playing with you know, Knicks and Kaminga and Green on that one team. How does that all work? I guess we'll get a better idea over the coming years of seeing how all these prospects working together on this one team, how that can potentially mask their uh, abilities or their upside or their projection heading into the NBA draft. And we'll, we'll find out when you know, those four guys will probably get drafted in the, the top 45, I would guess, this year. Do you see Todd being that sort of guy? Yeah, I think he's got a really good chance to go first round just because in the open workouts, you know, he, he's going to show off his offensive skill set and being 6'10", athletic, put the ball on the floor, that's a rare combination of um, talent. So interesting that you, so you've got him, or not almost exclusively, but almost exclusively as a four. Yeah, I don't see him playing the five and I don't see him playing the three in any capacity. I couldn't see him playing the three. I thought maybe more more as the five, but that, that's interesting to see if he's going to be playing next to a big man. He's a... Uh... Majority of his career, maybe that that lack of uh, rim protection and defense isn't quite as important. Let's go on to the last guy we're going to talk about, Jeremiah Robinson Earl, a 6'9 forward, 20 years of age from Villanova, played two years in college, averaged 16 points, some pretty good shooting numbers, 50% overall from the field. He averaged eight and a half rebounds as a, as a power forward. Um, unfo- I say pretty good shooting numbers, pretty good field goal percentage. Horrendous shooting numbers, 28% from three on three attempts per game. That actually went down from his freshman year where he played a a pretty big role as well. 33 minutes as a freshman, uh, shot 33% from three. So I'm going to guess that that's his swing skill to be that stretch forward player. So to an extent, I actually don't think he has a true swing skill that keeps him in the league. I see him as one of the very highest four players in the draft. I have him as a lottery level talent because of that. I do think that the jump shooting will come with time. It's more that he just missed a lot and his form isn't bad. It's identical to Maxi Kleba who has shot 40% from three in this league. So I think there's a lot of promise in that area. It just needs to become consistent because he had games where he was going five of five from three. And then there were games where he went like, oh, of six, just to completely negate it. 
So as he gets consistent with that, his offense will really skyrocket. So is he an offensive player more or a defensive player? I think a little bit of both. His best skill is his basketball IQ and just being mistake free. I mean, I tweeted this uh, a few months ago, actually, was, you know, every time I've watched Jeremiah Robinson Earl, I've never seen a play where I'm like, what are you doing? On either end of the floor, he never steps out of his own comfort zone in, in a positive way, not like he's scared to take risks, but he is very calculated in his risk taking. Okay, so you, you've, you've talked him up quite a bit here. What, where, where do you have him? Like, do you have him as a, a top 20 guy, top 30? Like, what, where's, what's, do you have him on a big board? Yeah, so specifically, I have him at 13th, and it's just because I really do value high floor players, and I see him as a crazy high floor player with reasonable room to improve. That being said, I don't really see him going to get drafted before number 20, especially because he only had a plus one wingspan. But he's a pretty good athlete. I think it's something that's underrated about him, despite lateral quickness uh, being a little bit of an issue. But I think there's a lot for him that he brings to the table day one. All right, so I'm looking at his numbers and the way that he plays, and I'm looking best case scenario to me is Paul Millsap. How do you view that? Or is he not not quite going to get to that level defensively? Probably that's probably a little bit high, um, just because Paul Millsap was once an All Star, and I don't I don't see an All Star in his future. But uh, kind of going back to a guy I already said, Maxi Kleba, and then Darius Sarge, okay. those are two guys who I could see as very similar roles for him. Which both those guys have a long place in the league. Yeah, they are just absolutely solid rotation pieces. You know, in Kleber's case, you know, good defender, solid shooter who dealt with you know quite a few injuries and COVID stuff this year that sort of you know dropped his stock somewhat, but really, really solid right across the board. And if you know you can get a guy like that in the twenties, that's it's a real steal. And I, I could see scenarios where he does even drop out of the first round. Could you see that? Yeah, especially with the wingspan. Unfortunately, I think I think he would go early thirties though. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. Now, that'll do it for us, Richard. That brings us to the end of today's show, Six Prospects Covered. That's 48 prospects covered over the last two weeks. We're going to be back next week with some more draft stuff. Undetermined how I'm going to do that yet, but we'll see what that is. Um, Richard, tell everybody what you're doing and where they can find your work. Yeah, I'm doing audio scouting reports just about, you know, uh, I do scouting reports on Draft and at Draft on Twitter. Um, and I'm doing the audio scouting reports on Locked On NBA Draft every Tuesday. So go and follow the Locked On NBA Draft podcast. Go and follow Richard at Mavs Draft over on Twitter. And don't forget to follow this podcast. Actually, Richard, I better say thank you. Thank you for coming on. Yeah, thank you for having me. Guys, follow this podcast, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and on the Odyssey app on YouTube. Give it a thumbs up. Thumb right up the middle. Ring the bell. Hit the subscribe, share, leave your comments, all of that great stuff, guys. We are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.